armed with more than 25 years of experience, our next expert leads an engineering group to enable, accelerate, and assure transformation at the speed of relevance by leveraging DevSecOps, Agile, Lean AI ML, and other technologies to create a smart software platform. He is currently the Technical Director of Continuous Deployment of Capability Group in Software Engineering Institute at the very prestigious Carnegie Mellon University in the USA. And now, he'll be coming to your screens to throw some light on the five common challenges to implement DevSecOps successfully. With that, let's extend a very warm welcome to the one and only Mr. Hassan Yasser. This is Hassan Yasser. I'm a technical director, as a faculty member at Software Engineering Institute, Carnegie Mellon University. Depends on where you are, I would like to say good morning, good afternoon, or good evening. I hope you are in person attending the DOIS Summit 2020 and hoping to have you guys next year on Bobby. Before starting my talk, I really would like to make sure that everybody's safe and held in this situation. I'm wishing you best in this environment. So what are we gonna talk about today? It's about five common challenges to implement DevSecOps successfully. We have been hearing a lot on DevSecOps. It's a great story, but there are a few challenges I would like to cover up today. So it's about me. And I have been in this business almost 25 years. I do a lot of work with the DevOps, DevSecOps, and more, more work about the agile thinking as well. So I have been teaching the DevOps since 2015 at the CMU as a graduate level. And also I have been part of the various conferences as speakers and the PC members as well. So I have another story. It's about me as well. I really felt the DevSecOps speed. So what that means, I know we go fast, that's what the DevOps it is. The idea was when you go fast, we don't want to fail fast either. We have to really close our mouth as you see in the picture. So it was an experiment, how you see the speed of delivery in a physical manner in a human mindset. So that's basically driving a car and the, the top is open or a driving motorcycle with 250 miles per hour. So that's going to be face looking like if you like that. So technically, we are going really fast. When you compare in 25 years ago when I started the software engineering career, we were deploying in a year. Now we are deploying in a millisecond. That's what is representing DevSecOps concept. So what I'm going to cover up today, talking up really what DevSecOps it is and a few challenges that have been gathered based on my years of experience, what I have been seeing in various organizations, various platforms. Then lastly, I talk about the, how you're sustaining the DevSecOps environment as a platform and what will be next. Let's start our journey. I know you heard a lot of definition of DevOps, DevSecOps. This is the definition actually formal from IEEE. And what is DevOps it is? It is a set of practices and principles emphasizing collaborations and communication between all stakeholders, including IT operations, developers. It is not just DevOps. I know we have been talking a lot. We are saying all stakeholders, but I really would like to emphasize other stakeholders such as acquirers. And if you are in a big organizations, your acquisition team should be part of it as well. Your supplier should be part of it. If you are buying a, a component or a libraries from your third party, from your other vendors, if your vendor is not really following up DevOps practices, your DevOps practices may fail as well because you may not able to get updated on time as you need it. Especially if you are building a systems and a complex systems, it is gonna hurt you a lot. So it's basically across all stakeholders, whoever has a duty or a, a responsibility in the life cycle of software systems has to have all communication between all team members, including vendors as well. So what is DevSecOps? I know we have been hearing many words like you know, set DevOps or DevOps SecOps, which we are talking about right now, or rugged DevOps or secure DevOps. And all of them are similar or same concept, not a similar, same concept. It doesn't matter how you call, it doesn't matter where you put a secure, the beginning or end or middle or something else. The intent of the DevSecOps, all this combination is getting a security thinking and all the activities in the life cycle of the system that we are building. I know when we are say the requirements design, coding, testing, delivery, it looks like a waterfall. It is not, it's a phases of life cycle. 
whatever we are building, there are phases in it. So each phases, we should be really carefully adding the security in each phases because we cannot done security in one of the elements we have to do across the life cycle. And based on the survey, we have been seeing that mature DevOps practices are constantly testing, deploying, validating software with requirements fast recovery. And of the problem, they are able to go faster and failing safe. So for my word is DevSecOps is DevOps done right. If you have done the, the run, if you do the DevOps properly, we should not call DevSecOps. Technically, it should be part of it. You know, if in the by definition, how we are talking about reliability or scalability, and secret is one of them. But we are not doing proper work. So when we say DevSecOps, we are saying DevOps is done right. And there are a couple of principles I would like to call out for DevOps. And we would like to expect when we say DevOps, you know, principles wise, we're expecting future deployment and iterative incremental development and also the automation every phase. It's like the process should support us. And also we have to have automation every phase. It's like not just the deployment phases, not just for the testing. We should have every phase as possible. You know, as a behind the scene, as we can see it here, like engine is maybe running behind this like a CI and CD code review testing, but we would like to automate every possible phases so we can add a continuous feedback throughout the life cycle. That's the principles of DevOps. When you have a continuous feedback, when you have a full automation, we are generating data, getting all the stakeholders involvement and creating traceabilities. So that kind of like we should see as automations that support our automation concept, that supports our process. So what are the really key benefits of DevSecOps? And we are able to repeat the steps. We have a continuous availabilities and throughout the life cycle, throughout the uh, pipeline itself. And we are ready to respond. So I'm gonna call it specifically responsive to the business that includes the bridge. Again, based on the survey, what we find out that if you have a mature DevOps pipeline, we are able to respond in a bridges as faster, as quicker as possible. Why? Because we have a fully integrated pipeline. We have a good traceability. We know all the artifacts. We know all the requirements. That makes easy for our organization to respond in a bridge quickly, including the artifacts, including the, all the components that works together to respond quickly. That is really increasing our stability and quality at the end. As a result, we are having a good continuous feedback to the stakeholder. As we said at the beginning, we are looking for a strong collaboration and communication between the stakeholder. That's how we can achieve it, the DevSecOps concept. So now we are saying, yes, let's think about security from inception, from beginning, how we start the project and how we deploy in every phase of life cycle. I know it's really, a hypothetical, it is great to say, think about security at the beginning to improve the delivery of the quality that we are building. However, it is really challenging, right? So let's talk about the challenges now. So if you know the challenges, then we can make that happen. So based on the, our work, I have been seeing about uh, the five common challenges so far and in organizations. So I'm gonna cover up each of them, such as security assurances, organizational barriers, quality, skills, and guidance. So we can umbrella all together. So I, all of them are related to each other. So we don't really say if we achieve the one organization barriers, it is not enough. We have to address all of them. Again, we are talking about a life cycle perspective. We are talking about organizational thinking. It is not just a team perspective. It is not a tool perspective. So let's cover up each of them separately. First one is a lack of assurances. So what really that means, lack of assurance is, is the three components. Like we don't, we don't have a lack of assurance model in industry, a business lack of assurances, or the project lack of assurances. Like we are in the community, we have some business related pieces and project related pieces. To overcome that lack of assurances, specific for industry, we don't want to wait for industry to start to work. As a team, seek around, go to the conferences like those conferences, DevOps India Summit. Join with the formal groups and ask how other does. Look at other organization, the similar you, similar to the, your organization, similar your compliances, similar your expected work and work others. So we are, as a group of people, as a group of community, we're gonna build up an insurances model, like how much we can tolerate any security components. 
how much we should do with respect to the new threats, how much we do for a new dependence libraries. Once we learn from industry, we're going to talk about our business focus as well. What is our really fundamental work we are trying to do? So do we have a requirements? Is it security requirements? Do we know our business risk? Find out the business risk, what you have, and then get the security requirement for each of the business. So now we are tying the security with our business so we can define our risk mitigation strategies. I don't want to read all of the bullets. I'm going to leave it to you, read it later on, read it. But really, we have to think about how we do for our business, and security is also part of it. If it is requiring educate our management team, yes, we should do. As a developer or a security expert, don't expect that the management team knows everything. That's our responsibility, explain why we are doing security, why we have to address some certain vulnerabilities, what is the impact and effectiveness to the business content? What is really causing the risk? Or if you have a risk team, and aware of the risk team with your security team as well. Lastly, when we work on the projects, now we are starting from industry, we went to our organizations, now we are to the project level. When we go to the project level, try to map our project tools or code changes relevant to the business risk, relevant to the industrial model. So we should able to connect the dots by talking the project level. That has to be done at the beginning, in the project level. So if you get a mindset changes, if I'm managing the projects, if I'm able to track some changes or the workload, I should tie it back to the, my business, business risk, and actually based on organizational or industry model what I learned. Let's go to the next one. It's actually a famous one, organizational barriers. The biggest, biggest barriers for the DevSecOps as the challenges is organizational problems. I know we call it a cultural problem sometimes. That's true, but I would like to expand that cultural term, which is the first one is more about the culture, like poor stakeholder collaborations. We're not really talking, even though we are in the same organizations, we are talking the same language, we are in the same building sometimes. Maybe we are in the same room or the same team, we are not talking same language with respect to the security and risk because our mindset is different because we are not really looking for the same view as a developers or a security team or a management perspective. That is requiring a strong collaborations, a strong communications. That's the reason we said at the beginning, it is not just that and ops. It is everybody else, including the security. It's not the security team is not enough as well. It is requiring a management team, other set, set of the folks as well. So these are the couple actions we should do a uh, stakeholder collaboration, changing the mindset, building up the cultures, and put the security team into the dev team and share the artifacts, share the notes, share the lesson learned, and put ourselves, other team members, be in empathy and create an empathy for the workplace. Another barrier I have been seeing about integrity and pipeline security. So we are talking about the culture. Now, sometimes the tooling is cre creating a barrier for us. When I say tooling, we don't know what type of metrics are we going to use. And then maybe you're using some sort of tools like assessed or DAS tools are not integrating well into the life cycle, into the tool perspective. So now organization, we are saying, okay, great, we are talking, we have a meetings, we are a great team. But if your pipeline is not integrated with all the elements, such as communication systems or issue tracking systems or build systems, if they're not integrated to each other's and tool becoming a silo. Think about one example. If my issue tracking system is not communicating well with my communication, like a chat, and how are we gonna improve the feedback mechanisms? Or if you are building a component and if you are calling the DevOps just a source code control and, and then build system here, then ignoring the monitoring element, ignoring the code review, ignoring the other test tools and harnesses, you're not creating an ecosystems in the platform, then everybody can share and learn. So in other words, if I'm running a static analysis tool as a, as a part of my CI server, if I'm generating as a security person about a 50 page of report, then how do you expect that 50 page of report will be read by the developers? They will not rip at all because they don't have enough time. So right now we are creating a barrier as using a wrong tools, not integrated platform. So 
we said cultural is okay, but at the same time, we have to create a good technical architecture with respect to the DevOps pipeline. So that will help the, everybody else or the stakeholders to communicate well. And then in organizational, we have to make a secret as a, a high priority. We are saying it great, but we are not putting a high priority. I understand business looking for a money for a business to get the user's hand at a good product. But remember, users always asking a secret by default. They're not saying probably, but they're asking all the time. So we should be a mindset, yes, secret is a high priority. Whatever we do, we have to protect our data. We have to protect our customer rights. We have to protect, protect our customers as well. Even though they're not asking maybe uh, explicitly, we have to really cover up what they are thinking. So we have to put ourselves as a customer, as a users, we don't want to lose any data, right? Nobody wants to see the personal data or a password somewhere else. Think about that perspective. So using a, a priority of the work as an organization, that is really changing a lot. Couple of tips here, like you can use evangelist concept, build up the culture, you can embed the security, you can do the postmortems. There are a variety of ways you can increase the prioritization of an organization that you can do. And third one is a lack of quality. So what that means about the quality, in the DevOps world, it's kind of like a side effect. If you go fast, 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 it doesn't mean we're gonna fail fast, but we have to learn from what our mistakes. So why we, when we go fast, we can deliver the code in a production environment. It is not the intent of delivering a code into the production environment or a goal. When we deliver it, we have to have a high quality should be in. We don't wanna send a crappy code into the production environment. We would like to send the code has been properly addressed and security component is part of it and compliance is part of it as well. So we have to brought security as early as possible into the life cycle by keeping the quality components, which we covered up at the beginning, that is getting a risk components, getting a compliance perspective, adding into it. And next one is the lack of confidence in the release. So we are delivering a product, we are delivering a code into the production environment what we are missing about the uh, uh, risk, like such a compliances, some organizational compliance perspective, such as using a GDPR or FISMA. So we are not adding that quality into the work itself. So what we should do as an organization, we have to add uh, compliances into the, our confidence. We are releasing the code, but we're gonna make sure that we are supporting our conversation with auditors. We are supporting compliances. So quality should be part of it, our work. When you talk about the system complexity, so we are building a systems that every system has a lot of, there are, there are a lot of sub components in it. And how are we gonna deliver the a complex systems with a secure mindset in it? Couple of tips here, identify a proxy metric for complexity and put all the number of issues in the production and then time to deploy the application you should do. So build up the pipeline that may be specific to the sum of the components and you make developing a microservices concept, you may creating a pipeline of pipeline, as a result of pipeline of pipeline, you can add a security connection with each of the pipeline. And one example, and I would like to give you as an example in Amazon, how Amazon did it, they're building up a pizza size team, I think it's security, but Amazon has hundreds of pipeline. So each pipeline are talking each other in terms of sharing artifacts, sharing the build, like creating an integration of uh, any component has been developed from small teams. When we do that, we have to put the secret policies into the production integration every phases as well. So start from here, look for iterations, look for the system level, you go from there. And fourth one is the secret skills. It's a favorite topic for me as well here because I have been teaching at the CMU and talking about the software security and DevOps class. I have seen so many examples. We don't have a skilled knowledge with respect to security that's known from everywhere else. So starting from the business, our business teams, they are not thinking with the security mindset because they don't know, first of all. They didn't have enough knowledge about what the security means, what the relationship with the risks, what are the common vulnerabilities are, what type of risk and security we have in a specific project there we are building. So train your business team, identify what are the possible security work is needed 
and train the, our business teams. If you are a developer, if you're an architect, please talk to your business analyst, explain what the security means, and they can put in the prioritization. Explain what the context and impact it is, and talk about the risk team as well. And developers, it's the great one. Everybody's really uh, hammering the developers because they are thinking developer, they don't, they should know everything. But remember, developers are trained specifically writing a better code, creating a better architectures, writing a code with their business needs, writing a code based on the language skills what they have. They don't have a secret skills as a developers. They don't have information about the low level vulnerabilities as an example. They don't have a domain knowledge at compliance, compliance requirements. So that has to be trained with the developers. Don't expect that developer will know everything they will write the code for you. That's a bad, bad assumption from the security perspective or management perspective as well. What we should do, we have to train the developers based on the work the work will do specifically, such as work is, is working and building up the code and building up the motivation, building up the work and aiming the long-term perspective that we should do. And also we have to rotate experts on a team that is possible, like building up a team and they are sharing knowledge each other and they are sharing their lesson learns and building up a training, building up the work itself and by learning from our the work that we are doing it. And more specifically, when we train the developers, we don't wanna train the developers up front and let them spend five days on secure coding practices. Do the training as effective for developer. If developer are using a, a code right now, train the developer for specific technologies. If they are using a, an, a PHP or using a Django or using a Python, train the developer in the context of that language technical needs. If they are using a CC++, train developer best secure coding practices on specific language. Then other things I will advise here, when a developer are using a, a static analysis tools or the, any type of the command line or helper, let the tool fit the information to developers what they can do and what needs to be done with respect to the code they are writing. Other one is the auditors. So auditors, is they know their stuff, they know their compliances, but they don't have enough information about the content we are building. So build up the knowledge and help the auditors what things we are addressing in our applications. What are the components we are building? And let the auditors know your context, your domain context, your knowledge, your compliances, and then sharing the knowledge with auditors. So auditors, again, they don't know probably everything, but they let auditors know about the basic concepts, such as common standards, OWASP top 10, and maybe the high level of the NIST 53, 800-53, or ISO 27001. So these are the couple examples, and you can let auditors know about it. The fifth one is insufficient security guidance. I know you may say that we have so much guidance out there. What is really important for us as an organization? We may not have enough security resources in our organizations. When I say security resources, you, you may see a lot of information is out there. What is really specific to our organization that we need to achieve? Do we have a policy? If you don't have any policies an organization, build up your policies. Build up your domain knowledge for your organizations. So your teams can look at it at common resources in the organizations. So you have more education, but let's say you have some trainings maybe, share that training resources with the rest of other team members as well. Make it available. So that's the need about that said at the beginning, like the stakeholders, even the HR will be part of that exercise as well. Like how are we gonna get the training in and available for everybody? So start with small, build up the knowledge and every iterations, every deployments, every training will generate some data. Put that data in a common place, let's learn together. I believe if you start in a small, in the next five years, we can have a huge mountain of data, specifically our secret resources, everybody can use and utilize it. And as the last about the secret standards, so there are a lot of secret standards. Don't pick one and start implementing it upfront. There may be OpenSIM, maybe BISIM, maybe SANS. There is many, many standards, maybe 27,001. Start with a small one. 
Start with OS top 10 as an example. And when you start small example, try to edit more and more and, and build up the standards for your organization. It's just starting small and make it bigger eventually. Start with the low hanging fruits first, like putting a CI for testing as an example. Grow the team from upstreams and downstream for next easy implementations. Put the policies into the, your workflow and avoid any type of regressions and stuff. So start small, build up bigger, and then make it more domain specific. That's the way you can increase your lesson learned and build up a knowledge as work. The monitoring is the very important element for me. I know we talk about the principles at the beginning, but when we do the monitoring, we have to monitor from production environments to everywhere in the life cycle. One specifically, we have to really look at what type of things we have been seeing in operation and environments. What type of attack patterns we have been seeing. It. That is really helping us build up a feedback loop to the ops team development and beyond. So one specific example, if we know as an organizations, we are getting attack on the certain IPs, maybe certain module of the code, maybe certain segment of our product, our products, we should share that information with all stakeholders, including developers. Why? Because we should be upfront for any type of possible breach in the future. If you see an attack, if you see a, a couple interest, maybe try to get some password, maybe try to get some data, maybe some of the API is getting attacked, some of the components getting attacked. We have to share the information as apps monitor it and giving to the team members, they will understand. Another element of the monitoring, the feedback is crucial in the DevOps, right? But it has to be on time and effective. We don't want to share the feedback with a hundred of pages. We have to share the feedback and specific to the work needs to be done. When I say the work, like feedback should be on time, should be useful. If you're running a, a basic log files, don't send the 50 pages of report as a result and let the developer address it or actually address it. Has to be useful, has to be specific sometimes, has to be very targeted. But the worst case, we should build up that monitoring concept for future needs as well. So if you monitor it proactively in the life cycle, that is including our life cycle in the component as well, including production and wiring. So if you can effectively put the work into the place and then use it over and over and again. Remember, DevOps is going to help us to get better by doing lesson learn. How are we going to do lesson learn? Monitoring components. The last challenge, it is outside the fifth one, it is sustaining your DevSecOps environment. Well, now we have great. We build up the platforms, we follow up the challenges, we have good organizational cultures, we have a good risk, good assurances. Now we have skilled people. But Important elements, how people that are gonna use effectively your DevOps environments. Like we have a hire, we just hired a new developer as an example. How developers will start to use. If your developer is able to use DevSecOps environment at day number one, it's a big win for you. And we should make sure that all the stakeholders should able to access the environments. A couple tips, and we can develop a, a playbooks we can create a startup guidance, like we can create an architectural guidance, like where we are storing the artifacts, here's our build process, here's our repositories, here's how we build up the, in the code check-in styles, here's our code style, here's our common libraries, here's our common services. So these are the couple of tips and we can effectively help a newbies or other team members using an environment effectively. Other things I would like to call out about the environment usage policies. What are the build and deployment strategies do we have? Do we have written somewhere else? Again, it is a communication we have to keep in our team members. We have to understand our DevSecOps environments. When we understand, when we know all the components we can use, they said you can do onboard trainings, you can have some other trainings as well in the workwise, so you can build up very effective usage because we are paying money. Other element for maintaining the DevSecOps environments. Like how are we can update an environment with new versions. If you're trying to update the Jenkins in the middle of the build process, and nobody will be happy. 
because you're basically as an engineer and you're responsible for maintaining an environment, but you're causing an outage in the deployment. So suddenly deployment is not working. Maybe you're not able to push the new version of the production environments. So we should be updating an environment in a DevOps way. When we have a new support request for adding a new tools, maybe a rancher, maybe a new version of Tuckers, maybe a new version of Vagrant, Terraform, whatever tools are going to be used, how are we going to add these tools? A tip here, we can add, we can use a DevOps way for a DevOps environments. Like we can build up a staging, we can have a gradually testing cases, we can roll out the new tools by adding it. So having a mimic version of your DevSecOps environment, not a full scale, maybe a small scale, and do some base, some testings, some deployment first in your replica version of DevSecOps environment for a new tools. We have to be alert for any things in DevSecOps environment, such as and, and misusage or overusage of Jenkins. There are a lot of vulnerabilities that exist under Jenkins agents. Or a Docker example. If you're using a Docker, a lot of data mining components happening in Docker containers that is really causing outage in your systems. So a couple of tips here again, you can use the base image, you can create an environment hardness creations, you can use the pipeline orchestrations. And lastly, we're gonna make sure that we are securing our pipeline such as how we are managing the keys in the pipeline. How are we gonna use the dependencies in the pipeline? So treat your DevSecOps environment as another product, we are doing it. You have to do some security testings. You have to have audit records. And as you remember that I put a picture of all the components, every DevSecOps environment, every tool is generating a data. For audit purpose, we have to pipe that data, pipe out this data into the, cent the common centralized repositories that we can use. Specifically, such example like GDPR Article 14 and 42 are asking specifically how we are effectively as the monitoring and then make sure that we're not exposing the, any privacy data. So the audit and log capable will help you to identify any misuses of this pipeline. I know we trust our team members, but anything may happen. If something happens, we have to go find out who checked out the code, why has been changed, where we are pulling the dependencies, and how this build process are. All this will help to audit and look capabilities. As I said, almost every tool has audit. We have enabled auditing. We have the created logging capabilities, putting them somewhere else, and we can somewhere else with outside of DevSecOps environment, like as a basic policies and monitoring, we have to pipe up the data into different servers so we can store we can analyze later on. All right, so what is next? We cover up the challenges, we cover up the, the maintaining environments. So now what are we gonna do? It's a journey as I said. We have to assess what we have right now. It's basically the five steps I had described. So based on what we have, look at our environments, look at the challenges. We cannot overcome every challenges right away. Look at what are the challenges we have. Look for the quick wins maybe just getting a training for the business team, maybe just getting a training for dev team, maybe just having a basic uh, DevSecOps environment. Again, these are related to each other. Start from the quick wins, and then in the situation, help the team members, stakeholders, empower them, creating a championship program. Help the organization, the team members, let them succeed, let them work, let them learn so we can grow together. Whatever we do as a result of three steps, we have to measure our work. We have to measure in terms of how many secret defects we are able to fix. Do we have integrated pipeline? Do we train the people? How many training, how many things we train? How many developers got trained? So typically you can put some metrics in your work, either looking for secret perspective or measuring some training effectiveness or in or or integrating and, and getting an engagement with your business team or management team, whatever metrics you define as you're assessing your gaps, measure the results and evaluate that results. Look at what we have done. Go back to initial steps. One example, if you're using a Scrum methodologies, quick things I'd advise, do maybe every 15 days, assess what you have done with respect to your DevSecOps implementations. So what we have done, 
what is our plan for today or next sprint and what things going wrong, what can things we can improve. So the basic methodologies you can use to improve yourself and then go to assessing again. It's a journey. It is not a one-time things we can get it done. It's a building components, building together for better. There is no limit. Limit is your imaginations for automation concept, adding any components, supporting capabilities, okay? Lastly, and I would like to share a couple of GitHub repositories that my team and myself we are putting into the communities. If you wanna have some hands-on experience, please look at this GitHub page and, and you'll get exposed yourself understanding the DevSecOps environment and setting up a basic sonar cubes or setting up Jenkins, et cetera. And there are a couple of YouTube videos, you will see that and how you implement the gauntlet or the pen testing, such that example in your DevSecOps environment, understand the concept. Understanding concept is important to build up your knowledge in that context. Lastly, and I have been writing a continuous uh, the DevOps blog post or some podcasts and webinars, please reach out this website for further information. Again, this is a learning, and we were learning all together. So all together, we will share the information as we are a CI, we are sharing information through these channels. So you can look at it and you can look at more and get more understanding if you want. If you have any questions, you can reach out to me anytime. I'm happy to answer your questions. Thank you. Looking forward to have in person, thus 2021 next year, 2021 next year.